Thanks, Kevin, for a very thorough presentation as well as some provocative future insights. So uh, now I'd like to welcome Paul Jacobson, who uh, is uh, newly at the National Cancer Institute but was formerly at Moffitt and has, uh, has agreed to really take us on a whirlwind tour of these very common symptoms in cancer survivors. Thank you. I don't have a story to rival Kevin's. I took the metro here today, but <laughs> those of us who live in Washington know that that can be quite an adventure too, yes. So I'd like to spend the next few minutes talking with you about the importance of addressing fatigue, sleep, and cognitive functioning as part of the comprehensive symptom management of people with cancer, particularly during the survivorship period. I begin by noting that the burden of symptoms for people in the post-treatment period is substantial. A large survey a few years ago found that 27% of patients off therapy had three or more symptoms of moderate to severe severity uh, out of a list of 13 symptoms. And the most common symptoms, number one and number two, were fatigue and disturbed sleep. You may be asking about cognitive functioning. It wasn't assessed, and that's a story in and of itself. But other research suggests that it probably belongs in the top 10. The impact of these symptoms is also substantial. We know that poorly controlled symptoms contribute to poor quality of life and impaired physical and social functioning that they contribute to non-adherence and actual discontinuation of many oral therapies, including aromatase inhibitors, as well as some of the newer targeted therapies, such as imantinib, and that they also contribute to lower rates of return to work following successful completion of cancer treatment and impaired ability to work among people who do attempt to return to work. These symptoms uh, can present in many different ways. They can be pre-existing symptoms, that is, the things that predate a cancer diagnosis. They can be symptoms of disease, either part of the initial uh, presentation of the disease or symptoms of advancing disease, uh, frequently studied as treatment side effects, but our focus today will be on their persistence after treatment completion and new symptoms after treatment completion. And for each of these, I'd like to briefly run through their assessment, risk factors, mechanisms, interventions, guidelines, and future directions. So hang on. So for uh, post-treatment fatigue, we rely primarily on patient-reported outcome measures or PROs, most widely used one, or one of the most widely used ones, is the brief fatigue inventory. Uh, there's also been development of a semi-structured interview that gets at a case definition of cancer-related fatigue uh, to identify more severe cases. Risk factors include, not surprisingly, presence of pretreatment fatigue, the type of cancer treatment, uh, based primarily on research with women with early-stage breast cancer. Those exposed to chemotherapy are more likely to have persistent post-treatment fatigue. Greater body mass index. And interesting research coming out of the labs of uh, Drs. Uh, Bauer and Gans, looking at polymorphisms in inflammation-related genes, IL-1, IL-6, and tumor necrosis factor. And that last one relates to an important mechanism for post-treatment fatigue, and that is persisting inflammation. Uh, probably one of the best studied biological explanations for persistent fatigue is that uh, the cytokine network gets activated either because of disease or treatment, and in certain individuals, it never gets deactivated, never gets completely deactivated, resulting in continuing fatigue. Not mutually exclusive is a behavioral psychological model that focuses on the distinction between precipitating factors and sustaining factors, those things that give rise to symptoms in the first place, in this case, the effects of treatment, other acute side effects, and the way people respond to these symptoms, which sometimes can cause these symptoms to acquire a life of their own. Cognitive responses, uh, the natural tendency to feel hopeless and helpless in the face of continuing severe fatigue, and behavioral responses, the natural inclination to be less physically active, which may indeed exacerbate the problem. There's a very recent meta-analysis of interventions for cancer-related fatigue, a large number of studies, but as you can see, focused primarily on women due to the focus on women with early-stage breast cancer. And 45 of these studies were of patients who completed treatment. If I can get the laser pointer to work here, you can see that uh, there's evidence for the benefits of exercise and psychological interventions, mostly cognitive behavioral and the combination of the two. And these yield effect sizes in the small to medium range, which may seem disappointing, but most of these studies, fatigue was not a primary outcome and patients were not screened for the presence of fatigue to be in these studies. And in that subset of studies, we see much larger effects. But basically, uh, no effect here for pharmacologic interventions. These are studies mostly of psychostimulants. They don't show benefit for post-treatment fatigue, but they do have some role, perhaps, in the treatment of fatigue in patients with advanced disease. Results such as these have informed development of uh, guidelines. Uh, ASCO uh, adapted pan-Canadian guidelines uh, developed a few years ago, and the recommendations are for exercise and cognitive behavior therapy and that all patients who are at risk for persistent fatigue should also receive psychoeducation about ways to deal with it. There is some evidence, though not yet sufficient, to recommend mindfulness-based approaches, yoga and acupuncture. And as I just showed you a moment ago, 
no evidence to recommend psychostimulant medications. Future directions in this area is to expand findings on genetic risk factors. These were based on candidate gene approaches. It would be important to look at other ways of identifying risk factors. And clarifying the underlying biological mechanisms with the idea of inter inter informing intervention development. How can we translate these results into new interventions? In terms of treatment, I think we need to identify the recommended intensity of exercise, and that is, while we know the level of exercise required to, say, improve cardiorespiratory fitness, it appears that fatigue can be responsive to much lower levels of exercise, and if that's your primary goal, what should we recommend? And certainly to adapt effective interventions for more widespread dissemination and implementation, we've seen the development of home-based walking exercise programs, as well as telemedicine and uh, uh, web-based strategies here, and now we need to evaluate these in routine practice. And certainly for patients who don't respond to exercise or CBT, we need to explore new intervention strategies. Turning now to sleep, the most common way this has been assessed in the cancer literature is again with PROs. In this case, the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, a commonly used measure. But the gold standard outside of cancer is polysomnography, where if any of you have gone through this, you're usually sent home now with some equipment to monitor your motor function, your cardiac, your respiratory function. Uh, very expensive, not widely used in, in cancer research. However, a number of people have begun to use actigraphy, these wrist-based accelerometers. Certainly, uh, you're familiar with Fitbits. This is sort of a research quality Fitbit that measures motor activity during the night and is a good objective measure of certain aspects of sleep uh, uh, quality. Risk factors, again, include pretreatment sleep problems and exposure to chemotherapy, certainly among women with early stage breast cancer and a greater tendency towards cold arousability. This is an individual difference in responsiveness to environmental stimuli. Those of you who sort of jump at a loud noise, for example. The mechanisms, again, this precipitating sustaining model is now used also, has been applied to sleep problems. Uh, here, the sustaining factors have to do with cognitive responses. So the beliefs that you can't function if you don't get a good night's sleep, and behavioral responses, maladaptive ones include daytime napping, which is known to interfere with sleep at night. And on, again, another very recent meta-analysis, uh, the most widely studied intervention here is cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia. This involves dealing with those dysfunctional beliefs, relaxation training, and getting people to sort of associate bed with sleep and not with other activities such as watching TV, eating, et cetera. A uh, study of about 750 patients, again, a primary focus on women with early stage breast cancer. And a fairly robust effect size here in the uh, medium to large range, 0.76. But these are studies in which insomnia was the primary outcome and in which patients were generally screened for the presence of insomnia. And so uh, NCCN survivorship guidelines have some recommendations for insomnia. Our colleagues in Canada are way ahead of us. They've written guidelines for most of the major symptoms. And those recommendations include sleep hygiene measures, things like avoiding caffeine, uh, uh, during the day and daytime, avoiding daytime napping, cognitive behavior therapy. There is a role for the short-term intermittent use of hypnotic medications, but not their chronic use. And again, psychoeducation for everybody who's at potential risk for post-treatment sleep problems. And enough evidence to also suggest exercise. Future directions here, we focus mostly on insomnia, and there's reasons to study other sleep disorders, particularly sleep apnea, obstructive problems during sleep because risk factors for apnea include older age and being overweight, which are also risk factors for cancer, and it calls, it calls for other intervention approaches. Risk factors and mechanisms, we really need to drill down and identify agents interfering with sleep beyond the usual culprits, such as corticosteroids, and identifying the biological mechanisms by which, let's say, chemotherapy might interfere with sleep architecture, REM and non-REM sleep. Again, CBTI is ready to go. It's shovel ready. We need to find ways to adapt this for more widespread dissemination and implementation. There have been development of web-based approaches here. Most of the times, these therapies are delivered face-to-face. -face. And I'll add here that we need to consider the implications of a symptom cluster concept. Symptom cluster concept. Good. That's a tongue twister. Uh, that basically these symptoms co-occur, that the same patient who has fatigue may also have sleep problems. You saw that exercise might be a therapy for both, suggesting they might have a common underlying mechanism or that treatment of one symptom could have a cascade effect on the other. So we need to think more smartly about how to address these symptoms as they co-occur. Lastly, post-treatment cognitive problems. And I'll have to say there's a lot less known about this than the other two symptoms I described. This is an article, 2007, in the New York Times. Chemotherapy fog is no longer ignored as an illusion. And it's a story about a woman who is treated for early-stage breast cancer, treated with chemotherapy, and her family's moving cross-country. 
and she just can't organize this move in terms of everything that's required, had to hire a personal organizer, suggesting possibly problems in executive functioning. And this is one in which, frankly, the research community was a bit slow to react and was really prompted by patient reports and concerns uh, to, to get the research community to focus on this. A little bit more complicated assessment, we certainly have seen the use of patient reported outcome measures, the fact COG is a widely used measure, but most of these studies use neuropsychological tests. These are standard performance tests of major domains of cognitive functioning in which performance is evaluated relative to reference norms. So how does a patient or a group of patients a function relative to people of the similar age and educational background to identify deficits? And interestingly, these two methods, the patient report and the uh, neuropsych test, are only modestly correlated in many studies, uh, which has led to a lot of uh, speculation about the reasons for that, the possibility that these self-report measures might indeed be more sensitive than the neuropsych measures, but certainly something to be sorted out. In recent years, we've also seen the addition of functional imaging studies using MRI and PET and qualitative electroencephalography now being used in, in conjunction with the other types of measures to more directly assess brain function. Risk factors for post-human cognitive problems, sorry to tell you, include older age, that older patients are at more risk for this, and cognitive reserve. The idea here is that the more premorbid intellectual ability you have, the better you can sustain a neuropsychological insult that might be akin to cancer treatment. And so people with greater premorbid IQ have been shown to function better after exposure to chemotherapy. And again, some very early research on genetic polymorphisms, APOE, uh, the gene that regulates APOE has been implicated as a risk factor for dementia, and research on COMT, which is known to regulate uh, several neurotransmitters. The mechanisms include uh, the direct neurotoxic effects of treatment. Animal models suggest that uh, it's not true that these drugs do not cross the blood-brain barrier, that they may in, in very small amounts, leading to both gray and white matter volume loss, leading to reduced white matter integrity, and altered neurochemistry and metabolism, and also cytokine deregulation. Again, uh, peripheral uh, levels of cytokines and elevations of the post-treatment period are associated with the presence of cognitive problems. And treatment-induced hormonal changes. The best example here is androgen deprivation therapy used in the treatment of prostate cancer. Uh, reduces levels of testosterone in men to near castrate levels. We know in older men that testosterone levels are associated with cognitive function, and there's research now showing that administration of ADT is associated with cognitive problems and is associated with increased risk for dementia. Uh, while the NCCN survivorship guidelines have recommendations for evaluation of cognitive problems, they fall short of recommending interventions because there just isn't enough no known yet to recommend specific interventions. But I've listed here the things that are under study. This includes cognitive training, things similar to Lumosity, if any of you are familiar with that, online training. Memory and attention adaptation training, which focuses on helping people develop strategies to cope with loss, mnemonic devices and other strategies. More broad-based cognitive rehabilitation, EEG neurofeedback. There's also evidence that exercise may also have a beneficial effect, as well as another integrative medicine uh, techniques you see here. There is reason to further study psychostimulant medications in this context, uh, particularly uh, methylphenidate, and there are some reasons to look at also acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, uh, uh, Aricept, which is the brand name, uh, which has been used in the treatment of mild cognitive impairment and early Alzheimer's. Future directions for cognitive problems, uh, we need to figure out how to integrate these different assessment approaches. What are their relative strengths and weaknesses? How might they be used together? We certainly need to move beyond candidate gene approaches to focusing on uh, better understanding of genetic risk factors. And as the neuroimaging data and other data accumulate to clarify the structural and functional brain changes associated with this. Again, our primary focus has been on chemotherapy exposure, but there's no reason not to study other therapies, including hormonal therapies, other oral agents. We now uh, have a number of interventions that merit uh, full-scale trials, and some of these are currently ongoing. And we also, I think, need to explore the possibility of preventing cognitive changes, whether it's by not exposing patients to certain therapies, if not necessary, or by modifying treatment regimens, or by exploring uh, the development and evaluation of neuroprotective agents. And ultimately, we should have some evidence-based treatment guidelines for this large population of individuals who are experiencing cognitive problems. I'd like to take the last few minutes talking about how we can move these guideline recommendations into practice. And we heard from many people here, Niraj and others, about the gap between what we know from the research evidence, what the guidelines recommend, 
and routine clinical practice in many community settings. So for most symptoms, really it's a four-stage process. You need to have some form of universal screening to identify if there's clinically significant levels of that symptom, very brief screening, a more in-depth assessment for patients who screen positive to learn more about that symptom and identify contributing reversible factors that could be perhaps readily addressed. For patients for whom there are not readily addressable contributing factors, we move on to management and treatment. And our three major strategies include education and self-management strategies, psychological psychosocial interventions, and pharmacologic interventions, and then follow-up, uh, ongoing follow-up and reassessment. So that's what we need to do in practice, but we know that that's not being done, that there are several barriers to more effective symptom control, that even though patient-reported outcomes measures are now widely used in clinical research, they're not being used in many practice settings to identify the presence of symptoms that need to be treated. And even when PRO data are collected, it may not facilitate symptom control unless it's in the medical record at the point of care available to the clinician in an actionable format. We also know that even when symptoms are identified, they may not be adequately managed, that among many providers, unfortunately, there's limited awareness of existing clinical practice guidelines for symptom management. And in many cases, certainly in community settings, difficulty accessing the resources that I described for symptom management. And what this appears to reflect is the lack of systematic efforts to translate these research and guidelines into clinical practice. We never now have several randomized controlled trials that look at what are called integrated symptom assessment and reporting systems. The work I'll point out of Ethan Bash, Kathy Mooney, uh, Donna Berry, and others that shows that you can improve symptom control, you can improve healthcare utilization if you routinely assess symptoms, give that information to clinicians, and give them recommendations and patients' recommendations for what to do. So what we need is an implementation science approach that's yet to be applied, and how are we going to get there? Well, fortunately, uh, the people who worked on the Blue Ribbon panel, and some of them are in this audience, thank you, recognize that this was an area that's poised for rapid acceleration, that we have all the raw ingredients to really move the needle on symptom management widespread in cancer care. And their recommendation was a strategic research investment based on implementation science to accelerate the adoption of these integrated systems that gather and monitor patient-reported symptoms, whether it's with mobile applications, tablets in the waiting room, patient portals, deliver that to the point of care, which we know will improve patient-physician communication about symptoms, which, when combined with decision support using evidence-based symptom guidelines, uh, accessing these self-management strategies, these referral pathways, giving patients and their caregivers this information, can move the needle in terms of improving symptom management. And fortunately, um, Shortly after I arrived at NCI in September, I was asked to co-lead the group that was charged with developing funding opportunities related to this recommendation. I'm happy to say that uh, a recommendation was presented to the NCI Board of Scientific Advisors a few weeks ago. I don't have time to go into the details, but if you're interested, uh, you can find that presentation at this web address and look forward to a funding opportunity announcement later this year related to this recommendation. So in conclusion, when I think about symptom management and where we are, I think about the different phases of translational research. And honestly, there are gaps at every phase of translational research. At T0, underli identifying underlying mechanisms, I've given several examples about where we need to fill in gaps, particularly about the biological basis of common symptoms if we're going to develop new and more effective treatments. At the T1 level of testing mechanisms for clinical effect, we need to develop new intervention strategies based on this mechanistic understanding. At T2, evaluating new interventions, particularly in the area of cognitive problems, we need to do full-scale trials of promising interventions. For all these symptoms, not just the ones I mentioned today, we need to improve routine symptom management through implementation research, through the moonshot, through other efforts, through developing standards, and through developing quality improvement projects. And I look forward to the day where the use of PROs is so widespread that much like we can look at a national map and look at areas of the United States where we need to address issues related to cancer incidence and cancer survival, that in the future we could look and see uh, practices and areas where we need to improve symptom management because the use of these measures is so widespread, they're in so many different registries, that we get a really national picture where we are so we can improve health at the population level. Thank you very much.